Welcome. Um, I'm currently in New Zealand, uh, visiting an old home country. Uh, so this this video is recorded from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, you can see here some of the sceneries, the Sky Tower and the CBD. And it's spring, so everything is blossoming and get, getting to life again. So coming back, coming from Norway back to New Zealand was a bit of a exhausting. Um, yeah. Anyway, so what we will do today is we will extend the student project which we were working before into a persistent layer using MongoDB. So MongoDB is a non-SQL database system, one of the more popular ones. And we will use the existing project uh, as we have it on, um, on GitHub and extend it to cover persistence using MongoDB. Uh, you can learn more about MongoDB um, in the uh, official website. Um, and there is quite a lot of documentation about the JavaScript layer for interacting with Mongo. Mongo is very popular with Node.js. Um, a lot of big companies are using it. Uh, today we will not use Node.js, we will use Go. And to use Go, we need a driver. Um, so we will use um, Mongo Go driver called MGo version 2. And to have, have it set up, you just need to execute uh, the go get command and then import the go package in mgo.v2 and you're ready to go. I've already run this command so I have uh, the dependency sorted. I've already installed Mongo so you go and uh, download the version for your operating system, uh, pick a uh, community server, pick your operating system and install it. I'm currently running 3.4.2 on this laptop, um, but the latest one, as you've seen here, is 3.2, sorry, 3.4.9. Um, so, um, yeah. So we may, um, 3.4.9. Uh, so I encourage you to install the latest one. I will update mine after the uh, the video is recorded uh, to be co consistent with you. Once you install the uh, the Mongo subsystem, um, you have to run it. So in your command line on Mac, I have to run Mongo daemon Mongo D. So it's Mongo D. It's the daemon which runs the database layer. Uh, I'm running it here uh, so I can see some uh, debugging output. It is kind of important to understand that Mongo stores everything in your local file system and the default location for everything it stores is slash data. So normally if I do this, um, I can see uh, a single folder called DB and that's where all the databases for my current Mongo deployment are stored. Not to run the daemon as root, I created the slash data and uh, db folders myself and granted the permission to myself. So me as a, as a user can now run Mongo daemon as a user and it will have access to write and read from the db subfolder. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other way is to tell uh, Mongo daemon of where the root folder is. Uh, as I said, the default location, which is slash data, is, um, is the default. But you can overwrite it by a configuration file or by command line parameters. I was a bit lazy to do that. So what I did, I just changed the permissions on the DB folder to Marius N. And then that means I can run the Mongo daemon 
as as Marius. So what it ha what happens is it basically starts up uh, the daemon. It tells me you know everything is fine. Um, it warns me that uh, uh, some parameters of the uh, control structure are not optimal, uh, and also it says um, that it detected data DB files. Uh, so that's where all the databases are stored. So once you have it running, once you know MongoD, once once you execute a MongoD command and it doesn't quit, it kind of runs. You can connect to your Mongo database using a command line shell, and the shell uses kind of a subset of JavaScript. So and some extra commands. So to get into the shell, I type uh, Mongo, and then I'm in. Currently, there is no authentication or anything for my local laptop. You know, play around deployment of Mongo. If you're doing a deployment on the server, you more likely secure it with a access control layer uh, for your you know development I, I don't on the laptop I don't store anything persistent here is uh, just for trying things out usually and then you see here that I have a new connection from a local host um, so if you if you look here um, I have a new connection from localhost one connection open and it specifies you know who connected to me mongo shell uh, and so on and so forth so you can kind of uh, do a little bit of debugging watching the um, the output of the daemon uh, in in this kind of console here so what can you do here uh, and of course i have the warning that you know there is no access control uh, everybody can read and write from my database which of course, if it was a production environment, that would be a, a big no-no for playing around, just deploying on your laptop, for trying trying things out, that's reasonable. Uh, okay, so what can I do here? I can check what databases do I have. So if I say um, uh, show DBs, uh, it will tell me, the Mongo shell will tell me what databases do I have currently uh, in my um, Mongo setup. So I have an admin, Edulab, IMT2601, local, and some other databases and how much they occupy. Um, to work with a particular database, as with MySQL, MySQL, you use use command, and then you pick which database you want to use. So let's pick local. Um, so now I'm, I'm using a local database and I can, um, I can check what collections um, this database has. So it says a startup block. So there is a single single collection uh, which is called startup block, uh, and that's all I currently see um, in the local database. So a local database show collections and shows me only one collection that I have. So normally SQL databases like MySQL or Postgres are organized into tables and Mongo, similar to other no SQL databases, is organized into collections. A collection is same as in Java or in uh, other, you know, C++. It's just a container of documents, a container of objects. And the objects are, if you think of them as JSON objects, then you will be pretty much spot on. Um, the objects that the collection stores is effectively a key value pair document, which can be nested. So it can have uh, a nested key value pair structure. So it's kind of similar to JSON. And in fact, MongoDB uses JSON to de depict the documents it, it uses. Um, so the local database that I'm using has a startup log, which is basically a log of entries of when I started the local daemon. Um, and I can add a new collection to it and add arbitrary documents to it. So 
Imagine that we would like to store students in my local database. Um, normally for your applications, you create a new separate database. So you have all your collections in one, one place, but just for playing around with the uh, Mongo shell, I will kind of use the local database. I will not create a new one. So if I were to access the startup block, I would say db dot and now I would use the uh, commands or collection type that I have available. Um, by the way, if you press uh, tab, it will kind of try to expand at the current point of what's available to you. So if I start typing startup uh, log and press tab, it unfolds and says, okay, you want probably a startup log collection because there is nothing else that starts with start. Um, so then at this point I, I have access to the collection and I have a number of commands that I can use. So if I press double, you see I can count the entries, I can copy things, I can create indices, I can drop the collection and so on and so forth. And there is one command or two that are quite useful, which is find and find one. So if I would say find one and pass no parameters to it, I will just extract a one arbitrary item from that collection. So if we do that, we get um, a JSON document, um, which is key value pairs, which shows me um, a particular um, starting up of the daemon, which dates on 19th of February. So 19th of February, um, I have, um, so on Sunday, February 19th at uh, local time around two o'clock, I started the daemon and it had this particular, um, process ID, the version was this and so on and so forth, right? So you see a typical key value pairs, a string key, a string value. Uh, I have a command line, which is a, a struct empty in this, in this case. I have a uh, process ID, which is a long number. So it has a particular type uh, using a number long. And then for build info, I have a nested structure, which is again, key value pairs, uh, array, strings, uh, array of integers and so on and so forth. You're familiar with um, with tables and with strings and numbers. We've done it before using JSON. So this is basically the same, right? So what I can do is I can um, create a new collection and insert an arbitrary um, item to it. How would I create a new database? Um, I would just uh, say use and say, you know, my new DB and it would create a new database. And then I, instead of DB local, I would be using DB that new database. Uh, in local, we don't have uh, students, but I can create a collection called students just by referring to it. And then I can insert a new student by using a command insert. And then what we do as a parameter, we effectively have to have uh, a JSON uh, document, right? Um, so I can have a student ID of some sort, right? Like let's call it ID one. And then I can have age, let's say 21. And I can have name, which be Tom. And now this is a well-formed uh, JSON document, which has three parameters and three values, three uh, attributes. And I can insert it into the student's collection in my local database, which I'm referring currently. So if I do that, the database system tells me, okay, number of inserted elements one. And now if I say show collections, I have students as the new collection in the database that I'm currently using. All right. So 
it's pretty straightforward. I can uh, recall that co that um, creation and say we'll have also Anna, which is one year younger than Tom, whose ID is two. And I will have two students now. If I tried to enter a new student uh, and use the same student ID, in fact, if I try to add a student with exactly the same data, okay, let's try to add Anna twice. What will happen? What do you think will happen? Well, I didn't tell any constraints on the student collections. You can uh, dictate some constraints on the student collection to prevent duplications, for example. I can say students uh, collection has such a property that student ID cannot be uh, duplicated. It has to be unique. In which case this insert, the second insert wouldn't work. But I haven't said that. I haven't put any constraints on my collection. So if I do that, I will have two Anas with exactly the same IDs and exactly the same age. How is, how is that happening? Well, it is happening because every time I add new item into my document collection, which is students, there is a special uh, property of all those documents, which is called underscore ID. And this underscore ID is generated automatically. So every document in Mongo has an underscore ID, which is a unique identifier of that document, regardless of what your constraints are. So by definition, every document has a unique key, which is the underscore ID, and that cannot be the same. So I now I have in my database two Anas with the same age and the same ID, and it is kind of a mistake, right? So let's try to fix that. Let's try to find her and remove one of the entries, which is a duplicate. So if I say students count, I can see that I have three uh, elements in my collection currently. So if I were to find, um, uh, let's say, let's find Tom first because it's a unique ID, right? So if I say, okay, I will have a student S, which is DB students find one. Um, I will tell you the difference between find and find one in a minute. So we need to search um, our collection. We are searching now students through some sort of a query. And the query is the pattern which uh, will match the document attributes that we have. So if we were to search students by the student ID, uh, we could say, find me everybody, uh, actually find me one student whose student ID is of particular type. So if I say ID, I will, I will find no, nobody because none, none of the students in my collection has a ID called ID. But there is one with ID one and that's Tom. So if I do that, my S now, my S variable is bound to that object, to that object of the collection. You see here the underscore ID, which has been generated for Tom. And then I have student ID, age and name, okay? So now with S, I can modify, um, I can modify Tom record by manipulating S. So if I display S, okay, it's the same. If I say S age equals 23, now S is 23 instead of 21. Uh, this is not stored yet. I just modified the reference, which is by copy, by, by value but I haven't persistently stored it. So if I were to find Tom again, so if I find Tom again by ID one, and you see H is back to 21, right? So how would you make it persistent? Uh, you would say S dot H equals 23, and you would say DB students. Um, and now we cannot, do insert because insert creates a new um, um, entry. So we let's let's try. If we say insert s, 
Um, so S has a particular ID, which is um, which is Tom, Tom's ID, and it has S has new property which I modified. So if I press this, it will say, nope, you cannot insert S because ID is already in the database, right? We are trying to create a new student S with the same underscore ID, and that is illegal. That is a constraint which is by default in the uh, in our collection. There are no duplicates on underscore ID. Okay, and to make it persistent, uh, instead of using insert, which will prevent me to override because of the ID conflict, I have to say students, um, so I have to say db students save s. So save is like an update. It will modify the existing document um, without um, complaining that there is a conflict. So it will override the properties which changed uh, in, a, in the database, right? So now I see that one um, record matched the save command and it has been modified. So there was no um, inserts, it was just a modification. If um, S didn't exist, then it would say none of the um, existing document matched and it would insert a new document with the particular ID which we have. So now if, if I check for S again, so if I find student with the ID one, uh, we have new age of Tom, right? You can nest the, the structures freely here. All right, so coming back to our di difference between find and find one. If I say students uh, find, it actually gives me a collection of all the documents which match the query. And in our case, all documents, because find with no parameters matches everything, right? So if I say count, it will tell me three, because this collection and this collection are basically the same, right? So if I count everything, or if I count the result of find, it's, it's basically the same collection, right? So if I uh, call find, I will get a collection with all the students that I currently have in my database, which is three of them. And it shows me all three, right? Um, this is um, kind of lazily evaluated. So um, if I try to store it, let's say I, st I try to st store it in C, uh, and then if I try to uh, you see, you see that C is empty. It's not actually um, the the collection that I was um, trying to 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 store. Um, the easiest way um, the DB students find returns a, kind of like a cursor which iterates over the result and prints prints up to 20 um, records and then you can print more, but you can't really iterate. I, I mean, you can iterate over it in the same command with the for each method, for example, but it's a little bit easier if we could store and refer to the particular one which we want to delete for this in this case, right? Um, so we have the duplicate of Anna, which is the one which has a slightly lo larger unique ID, right? Uh, the ID here is the is number three. Uh, we could just find Anna using find one method. So I, I can show you uh, how to do that. So if we do students uh, find one and we want to find S, that of course the variable name is arbitrary. You can use any variable name you want. Um, and here if we find Anna, by the underscore ID. So we say we are looking for this particular um, ID. Then we find the second record that we have and it's bound to S. So now if we were to say DB students 
uh, remove s, we would basically remove that that duplicate, that second um, Anna that we have. Uh, but if we were to do it with the original um, find, when when we find all the collections and we know it's number three, what we could do is we could turn it into an array um, and then store that array in S. Right. So S now is not a single document; it's actually a array of three documents. Right. Uh, so if I print S, I see it's an array of three JSON documents. So S is a document three JSON documents, and if I say I want uh, S, the second one, which would be 0, 1, 2, it should be the second Anna with the 841 ID, right? So if I do that, here we go, 841 ID, and that's the, the second item, and that's just a document, just one object. So now if I say maybe students remove S2, I can actually get rid of uh, the duplicate. And it works fine. I get the number of removed one. So now if I count all my students, uh, I should have only two left, which is true. If I um, print them, I have Tom and Anna. So you can do uh, more elaborate uh, searches. Uh, for example, you, we can try to find um, everybody who is older than 20, for example. So how would we do that? We would say, find us from the students collection, all the documents which have um, property age, and now, instead of specifying the actual value, I will specify the constraints that I want to be satisfied. And as it happens, everything here is JSON, so the constraints have to be specified as JSON too. So how do we do that? We put an extra JSON struct there, and we say greater than, uh, and then we specify what range do we want. So let's find everybody who is old, older than 19 first. Um, let's try that. Um, and we have two results. So now if we say everybody who is greater than 21, we should only get Tom because Anna is too young. Here we go. We only get Tom. And then if we say everybody who is 35 or older, we should get nobody. So this is a bit of magic. Uh, and to know what sort of uh, greater than, less than, uh, e uh, text, equality searches, and so on, how to specify that, you have to look up the Mongo spec, the query language. Um, it is relatively straightforward, um, but you know you will not guess some of the mnemonics that they use. So it's good to have the reference handy. OK, so we know how to insert, how to manipulate the database collection and how to um, uh, modify the existing entries. Uh, the you know, remaining concept is we have to understand that there are two ways of linking objects together. So I can, um, let's say, I want to specify, um, let, let's have uh, a concept of uh, a course, okay? So let's say there is a course and course has an ID um, or code, which is like, for example, IMT2681 uh, and an underscore ID, which I don't have to specify, that's managed by um, by the system automatically. And now I want to make a relationship between students and, and courses, right? So I have two options. I can say, okay, uh, let's take Tom. So if I find, um, find one Tom, uh, student ID is ID one. 
So now, um, I have S and I can, I can simply say S courses uh, equals an array and S courses uh, push and I can add this uh, that Tom is uh, taking the um, course code IMT261 and I can show you S. So I have student whose name is Tom who is taking courses and one of the courses is the cloud course. And I can, you know, he might be taking another course. Uh, he might be also taking, um, uh, let's say he's also taking, I don't know. Uh, IMT two six eight two. Okay, so he's taking those two courses, and I can show you that he is taking those two courses, uh, and I, we can save it. This is called embedding documents. So I'm making Tom and courses relationship in such a way that. I have the courses embedded into that document. I don't have a separate collection of courses. I have Tom, I, I, I mean, I have students collection and then students collection is using embedded documents which represent courses. Of course, the course can have a topic, you know, uh, apart from the code, you can have multiple properties here. So it can have a nested structure and it, in fact, it can be nested even further having some sort of schedule and so on added to it. So the document can have arbitrary complexity, but the point here is that I'm linking courses and students by embedding the courses, okay? What's the alternative? Alternative is that I have courses collection. So I can say db courses insert and I have now um, Yeah, we need to do this and say, I have a course called IMT2681 and now I have two collections. I have collection of students and collections collection of courses. And what I can do, so let's say um, S courses equals empty array. So now if I display S, it says, okay, uh, I have Tom. Tom is not taking any courses, but what I can do is I can say um, S courses. Uh, yeah, let's first find the course that Tom is taking. So DB courses find one and we only have one, which is the cloud course. And what I can put, I can say, as Tom courses push and instead of actually embedding the um, the document which represents my course I can represent the relationship by linking Tom to an ID and the ID links me to the actual course so now I have two collections a collection of students and collection of courses and I'm linking the student with the course just by the, by the ID. Same as you usually link tables in SQL database. You have some primary key and you're doing a relationship by saying, you know, this row from the particular table is linked to another row by some sort of ID, which is unique in another table. So it's the same mechanism here. Where to use which? Again, that's kind of a hard problem. Uh, we are not really studying database design or architectures here. Um, you will cover some of it in the database course, but it is, it is non-trivial task to design um, the architecture of your database. It depends how you are formulating queries and what you, um, 
what trade-offs you want to make in terms of flexibility versus speed and versus update times. So to give you some example, uh, typically if you only searching, let's say we have uh, a student and the student makes uh, comments in a comment system uh, and we only searching from the point of view of a student, then usually we would use the comment or the course, like in this case, as an embedded document. Why? Well, because if I find a student, like if, if I'm making a query in this model, if I found S, uh, if the courses or comments or some other documents is in a separate collection, I have to make two queries to get it. So when I found Tom, and then I want to say, okay, which courses Tom takes, I have to search the other collection for each um, course by the ID. In the original design, when we have courses embedded in Tom, when I found Tom by a single query to a database, I already have all the courses. So I don't need to ask again into a database for the uh, courses because they're already here. The side effect is that Tom document is a little bit bigger now, right? So if I always ask for Tom and his courses, of course it makes more sense to have it embedded. But if I'm sometimes asking only for Tom, or if I want to ask, okay, who is taking, uh, you know, cloud course, if I don't have a separate collection which stores my courses and links them to students, I would have to get everybody from students, you know, all the student collection, and then go through it and check which of the courses a given student takes, if it is a cloud course, and then create my uh, attendance list for the course. So, it, it, you know, it depends. It depends what you want to achieve, and do you want to have less queries into a database, but less flexibility, or do you want to have potentially more queries to the database, but more flexibility in terms of uh, combining and rearranging the data. So for a simple, you know, storing students, of course, students is a single collection. If you have courses and students, then you have to plan. Uh, will I be querying, you know, from the point of view of students more, in which case you can go with the embedded design? Or will I be doing some sort of data mashups and I will be querying as many times from point of view of a student as from the point of view of a course, in which case it is more beneficial to just operate on two collections and have two IDs stored here and here. Because in the course now, so if I go to a, so let's say we're using the non-embedded design, we're using the references. If I go to courses, um, and find, oh yeah, I only have one, so I can find one course, um, which is the cloud course currently. So if I say C equals my cloud course, so currently I, I have um, a cloud course is just a course uh, code. So C is cloud um, course code only, but I can say students um, is a collection, uh, is an array and I can put into cloud course that Tom is taking it, right? So I can say students push and I can actually push the ID of Tom and say um, Tom is taking that course. So now what happens is if I want to find everybody who is taking cloud course, I just grab the cloud course by the cloud course ID and then I have everybody's IDs uh, of who is taking it based on this reference relationship. Uh, and I don't need to duplicate the data, right? So you've, you've learned in the database about the normal forms without like I, you know, I try to minimize when do I need to change the data. Uh, if you embedding documents and let's say the description of the cloud course changes and you've been using the embedded design, you have to change the description of everybody who is taking the, the course. If you're using the reference instead, um, and you're using the cloud, score, cloud, cl cloud course as the reference, then you only need to change it in a single location, right? So that's much simpler. 
So depending on the objectives, you will use one or the other design. Okay, let's have a short break. Okay, welcome again. So let's review what we have gone through so far. Uh, we discussed uh, NoSQL databases and we said that they are characterized by um, uh, collections instead of tables. Um, and database is a set of collections. Collection is a placeholder or storage uh, for documents. Um, container for documents and documents are simple structs okay um, and we discussed mongodb so mongodb version 3.4.9 and we said that it has um, a shell so mongo shell uses javascript like notation with JSON documents uh, JSON structs and important thing is underscore ID is the unique key of every single document uh, and documents can be embedded or referenced referenced by underscore id which is an object id type All right so that's what we had so far uh, we can also list some useful uh, mongodb useful Commands. So we know um, show dbs. It will show you all the dbs that you have. You we have show collections. Will show you the collections of the particular db. Use db name. Will start using a particular database. What else do we know? We know db collection name uh, and then there are some methods for example find or find one all right so let's do this like this uh, find returns um, a set or collection but displays it so we would like if we want to access it we can say to array for example um, we can count it as well so we can call dot count on top of dot find or on the collection name directly uh, we also know insert and then you know a JSON struct of an object so an object or we can say save which will do update or insert depending if the key exists or not and we also know remove which we've used to remove the duplicate and we can also call drop which will drop the collection entirely uh, one top level useful command is quit so if we call quit it will quit the shell all right um, there is one more thing uh, that I haven't mentioned which is in normal traditional SQL databases um, we have something like atomic transactions so we can modify multiple tables 
through an atomic transaction which guarantees that all modifications which we are doing will happen simultaneously or will be reverted back. In NoSQL databases or in Mongo in particular, that's not the case. There is no such thing as atomic transactions. Atomic is only an update of a single document. So um, let's say characteristics. Characteristics. Uh, and one of the key key characteristic is um, no transactions. So what we do instead, we have to, if we need to modify something atomically, we have to make sure that it's a single document. So if we need atomicity, it has to be contained to a single document. So atomic updates or transactions in general, only on the level of a single document. What does it mean? Well, it means that we have to plan the structure of the database depending on the use cases. As we were discussing before the break, uh, it depends on your use cases and how you are managing the modifications. This will influence the design of your, of your database. So if you do need to have some atomic mo updates or some atomic transactions, you have to design the database in such a way that you will have it in a single object. What does it mean? Well, it means you will probably have to have some sort of embedded structure where you will be updating something, you know, on a single document using the hierarchy of the embedding uh, if necessary. Uh, unless if you unfold it into multiple collections, then you cannot have atomicity across collections between different documents. Um, all right. So that covers the, the basis. Uh, and now we can move on and use uh, what we know already uh, from the programming interface. So what we will be using is we will use the same code base as before. Um, I will uh, make sure that um, I have the code. Uh, so I will go to my go path, source, github, student db. Uh, I will make sure that I have the up-to-date version and I will start uh, IntelliJ. All right, so uh, we will be making changes to the to the code and doing what we've been just doing with the uh, shell using the uh, programmable API uh, to access the, all right, so we need, where is the here? Okay, so in, uh, instead of using something like PHP my admin to manipulate your database, uh, and with Mongo we effectively are using um, the shell, right? So I have my database running. Um, I will go back to the Mongo shell and uh, clean up a little bit of what we've been playing with. So um, I will use the local database. I will um, uh, DB students and I will drop that collection entirely. So I don't need that collection anymore. So show collections. I only have, oh yeah, we also created courses. So I will also drop the courses. Yep. So if I uh, show collections now, I only have start a blog. Um, so I will quit the shell. And now we have to plan our, our structure. So with the current design, we have um, let me just check. We have a concept of a student which has a name, age, and ID, um, which is a student ID, right? Uh, because Mongo will be using the underscore ID, 
And then if we have a property called ID and underscore ID, it will be a little bit confusing. So to make sure that this is um, um, clear, clearly differentiated, I will call it student ID. So instead of calling it ID, uh, I will say student ID instead. Right, so we make this small modification here and we will know that there is an underscore ID generated by MongoDB itself, which will be added to the uh, student struct uh, automatically. The JSON uh, properties um, will be used for the Mongo as well, I think. So we will uh, have the same naming convention within Mongo as we have within the JSON structs. Okay, so instead of having, a, so we, we have a student's DB, which is our uh, interface kind of to add, count, and get students. And we've been using the in memory um, database uh, kind of um, with the init, add, count, and get methods. So what we can do, we can, uh, we can keep that same, um, we can refactor it later as long as we keep the same naming convention. So we have init, add, count, and get, we can have a new struct which will represent our uh, persistent database storage and with the same interface we will be able to swap which one we actually using um, so for time being i will just add the persistent storage and then we'll refactor the code so we can swap the use of um, uh, in memory or mongo storage i have to also update the some of the um, yeah the things that we've that we've changed here. I should refactor the project so we don't have the to do it manually, but uh, it's too late now. So, okay. So what we'll do, we'll create a new, new file. Um, and let's call it database go. No, for now, we need to import um go package mongo version 2 um, and we will also need we will also need uh, Go package in Mongo version two vision. Okay. So we need Yeah, so the imports are currently unused because I haven't used anything yet. So we need those four methods to be the same interface as before so then we can have a consistent yeah so we we call it and it initializes the mongo storage and we will be using slightly different struct so let's have a type called students mongodb and it will be a struct and our struct will have um, we need to have uh, at least two things so one thing is where the database is whether we are using a local storage here on local host or whether we're using the uh, Mongo Labs, for example, the remote hosting, we want to be flexible. So we need the host, uh, which will be a string. 
And then the second thing we need is the, the name of the database. So uh, database name, which is also a string. Um, yeah, I think that's all we need for now. So let's say um, we have here students MongoDB uh, stores the details of the DB connection. And then we will be using this one, MongoDB. MongoDB, MongoDB, and MongoDB. All right. Uh, the idea here is that because our struct will have the same interface, we can pass either the in-memory storage or the Mongo storage to our internals of the system, and it should basically work the same way. Right, so we will not use the in-memory storage. Uh, we just need to clean that up. And what we will have here is uh, we need to initialize our database. Um, so there is a handle which is called MGO and the initial um, call that we are making is called dial uh, and it returns a session and an error right the the pointer to a session and an error if an error occurs so what we will do is we will call it on top of the the host url right so the first parameter it takes was the url of the database so yeah maybe we, let's call it host url oh even for consistency uh, the database URL and then database name. So we will call it with DB database name and it returns the session or an error. Okay, so if there is an error, so not uh, nil, well, we probably should quit. Um, the reason is that this will happen at the very beginning of our application and if we cannot connect to Mongo, then that means we cannot do anything with the, you know, persistent layer. So, um, and we're not returning any error here, we're not handling it outside, so I would say, you know, uh, panicking is probably a, a good solution in here if we cannot connect um, to the database. So we will we will panic, and then if we have um, the database connected, um, we have to close the session at some point. So we have to call defer session dot close. All right. Um, when the database is initialized, uh, we actually don't need to do anything. So, so this code pretty much doesn't do anything. It just makes sure that we can connect um, to the database and uh, we can start the call with the underlying storage. So we don't technically need to do anything. Uh, we will, I will, I discussed before the break that we can, uh, put some constraints on top of the collections that we are using. So we will discuss it later on. So I will skip that, that part for now. So I will say um, to do put extra constraints on the student collection. So for example, we have in our um, students we are saying that we have a property called student id and we don't want two students to have the same id so we would like to have a constraint which says um you know two students cannot have the same id make sure that it never happens um all right so const 
constraints. So when we, there, there are two ways of dealing with the connectivity to the database. As you know, I, I have session here. And then the moment I quit, the session is closed. Um, I could keep the session inside my struct because it's referenced here and then continue to use it. That's one way. But then if something goes wrong, I can, um, you know, I can have a session open. I can have some leaks. Um, it is nicer if we keep the session open and we close it for the uh, operations that we're using. So anytime we kind of doing an operation, we opening co connection, doing what we need to do and then closing it. Um, it has a kind of a side effect that we continuously opening and closing things. So it, it has a little bit of a, um, you know, performance cost. But on the other hand, I can, in parallel, open multiple connections, do multiple things at the same time. And each time I'm doing something, I'm guaranteeing that I, I'm closing it. So I don't have any resource leaks. And I have kind of robustness because if some of my um, routines, go routines or, or threats kind of collapse, it doesn't matter. Like the, the, uh, the sessions are kind of isolated to their own um, scope. So I will kind of, for those three methods, I, I need to open the session again and then close it. So that initial piece of code that I'm kind of doing it here, I have to repeat uh, for my adding a student or counting the students, all right? Let's do count first. So let's, let's go here and let's see how the count will look. So here I have the handle to the session. And on the session, um, you have something called DB. And I can get the handle to the database, right? It is kind of equivalent to what we've been doing in the shell uh, of getting kind of a handle to DB. So if I want to do that, I need to call DB. And then I need to call the database name. And as we remember, we're storing the database name in our reference. So we can say. Uh, db database name, right? So now I have the I have the handle to the database, um, and I can uh, on on top of the database I can get the handle to my collection. Um, so we can assume um, that the collection we're dealing with is uh, has kind of particular name, um, or we can parameterize it. So one way of doing the collection is to store the student's collection uh, in that in that handle, or assume that it's always the same. Uh, either way is fine. I will initialize it here. So I will say student's collection name. It will be a string. Okay. So then I can get to this collection by calling C and DB students collection name. So now I have a handle, a pointer to the collection. And then I can uh, run the same commands which we were doing in the shell, but you know, programmatically. So one is called count and it returns two things. So it returns the actual count and error if something wrong happened. And then uh, if there is an error, if error is different than nil, then I have to handle it. This is not panic anymore. I I'm, I'm have some sort of issues. I know, you know, the initialization worked. So I, I, if I'm doing something with the database, I used to be able to connect. Maybe there is a timeout. Maybe there is something down or something. So. I need to handle it somehow. So maybe I will log the error um, and then uh, return something. I have to return something, right? Uh, and so I don't have really a kind of a logger setup. So I will just uh, print um, so error connecting error in count. 
okay we just print what the error is so okay and then we have to return um, let's say we return minus one and then and everything was fine we return count okay so our implementation of count connects to the database uh, gets a handle of the database gets a handle of the collection and counts all the elements of the collection so that's pretty simple um, so let's do it with it we will have something similar so we will use the session to connect to the database we'll use the db database name as before and uh, we have to get the handle to our collection so we say cdb collection student collection name and now we need to um, obtain I, I mean we need to insert uh, a new student so we adding a new student uh, we call this initially add uh, which is sort of like insert uh, so you know we need to insert the, the document and our document is of the type student so it should just work like this um, let's check uh, what insert is um, returning so if I say mongo now we, we need to get um, insert docs go docs of the M MGO yes uh, we need the collection insert and it returns an error only an error all right so in our line we will say error equals and then if there was an error is different than nil we have a problem so we'll print again um, error in insert and we'll print what the error was okay so what we're doing is we're getting a handle of the database getting a handle of the collection and inserting into a collection and then if there is a problem we have a problem right so now we have the final part we need to implement which is searching uh, so again we need to get the handle of the session so we will repeat the boilerplate code that we need to do um, and we will do a search it will be similar to this so let's check on the collection how the find method works uh, we can find the ID of the object we want or we can find um, uh, we can run a particular query uh, and then we can there is no find one but if I go to a query query has its own um, methods and it is one of the method is called one okay so I can run um, I can run a query on the entire collection using this type of uh, example here and then constrain it to a single result right which is what we really want uh, this particular query that we want is uh, of the form that we have the key we hope to guarantee that the keys are unique that means that there will be only one student um, um, and if there is no student we are returning false so our uh, interface works like this we are returning a student if it exists and returning true if it doesn't exist we return false and a default empty student so 
Once we have this, we can call find. Whoops, find. And now it's a little bit tricky. Uh, then we will call one, and we will say we have um, we have a variable student. So let's say I have student student. Or even better, we can in pre-initialize it. So we may say we have an empty student. Okay. And then we can pass a reference to that, you know, the address to, to, to that student. If everything works fine, so if there is an error, if error is different than nil, we handle it. But if everything worked fine, we can return student, okay? And true. Uh, if there was an error, we can still return student because it's an empty student and we return false, right? So this is fine. Um, yeah, it, it is okay. Uh, we can do multiple returns. It, we often do that, like we've done it here. Um, if you are really uh, orthodox, what you could do is you could declare a new uh, Boolean variable. So you could say um, all was good equals uh, true. And then in here, we would set it to false. And then here we just return all was good. Okay. So we now have a single return statement. Uh, and if there was a problem, we just set the flag that, okay, there was a problem. But because we are using the same um, handle, uh, we can collapse it to just single return statement, which is slightly better. Okay, so now how we do the, the querying. Um, as you've seen in the example, it is quite simple. You, you basically have to create a new instance of M, uh, which is like, a, you know, you can think of it as a JSON struct where you're typing the, the actual query, like what do you want to search for. Um, so in our case, what we would do, we would say Bison M. And now we're searching by the student ID. So we have something which is called student ID. And we know that the student ID will be key ID. Okay. So that's how we search for the, for the student. All right. So we have um, our basic data structure ready. Um, we can now test it. So to test it, we will create a new file. Let's do that. Um, database test. Okay. So what we'll do is we will um, create a func test. Um, all right. And now it kind of suggests me what do I want to test. Let's test adding. Um, so we need first to have the actual database. Uh, we don't want to use the production database. We want to use a test database, right? So how about we have um, uh, two utility methods, functions. So let's say function setup db which will set the DB for us and uh, function tear down DB, which will shut down the DB for us. Um, if we were to uh, use it uh, with, with, without global variables, we need to have this kind of a DB handle. So we need the 
uh, students MongoDB handle here and here. And we also can have additional function which returns so um, which returns us this uh, Mongo. So in fact, we can we can collapse it to this to this function. So this function will return us the handle to uh, MongoDB, uh, which then subsequently we can use to tear down the same database. Okay. So what we need is we need a DB handle which is uh, of student MongoDB type, and it will have. Um, the database URL. So in our case, uh, we need to use, let's say, local host. Uh, we have to specify the port, so we just look it up in a minute. Uh, we also need a database name. So let's call it test students db. And we also need the collection. In our case, it be students. Right, so let's check uh, how we are dialing. So in Mongo, we need to dial the to, into the URL. So let's see. An example of um, yeah, how the Dial will work. Let's see, yeah, where is the dial? Yeah, let's check that. No. Yes, let's. Yep. Okay, let's do this. So the connection string is of the form. MongoDB username password optional host has to be there and then optional port. If we don't specify the port, it will use the default port, which is um, 27017. Perfect. So in our case, all we need is to say MongoDB localhost and that will be using the default port and we don't have any login credentials. Okay, so that's the... Um, yes, because... Uh, yeah, all right, let's see. And we'll return the DB here. And it complains that... No, we should not need that. Oh, yeah. I have to do this, of course. All right. So, now we do need that. Okay. Um, we need to actually connect to the database. Uh, so, we need to make sure that the that piece of code works. So we have to use dial and use the URL as we were doing before to obtain the session and an error. In fact, we don't really need a session. And if we do have an error, we 
yeah so let's pass the t testing here so we can say t error error okay so now in the tier down what we will do is we will uh, use the same handle as we have here so we will dial so we'll do the same and then if everything was fine so t testing t if everything was fine we will say actually we need a session now because what we want to do is we want to call session db db database name and we want to drop it drop the database uh, let's see what the drop database um, So on the database, if we call drop, it returns only an error. So we will say error if error is not nil, we say the error error. All right. So the teardown basically clears, like removes the database. So uh, and the setup initi initiates it. So we will have a handle to that to our DB and it will be called from the setup. And then we will say defer uh, tear down. We need to pass T and we need to pass DB to it. Okay, so now we can run some sort of tests and we are guaranteed that whatever we do, the database is dropped after each test that we are doing. So for testing additions, what we want is to call init. It should not, you know, throw problems. It shouldn't throw panic. And then we need a student. Student. Um, student. And we need to initialize it. Let's say it's Tom uh, and it's 21 years old. And the final was the student ID. Let's use ID one. So student and we would say DB at student. And now if we do DB count if db count is different than one we have a problem uh, before we add the student let's make sure that the, the database is empty so if we say if db count is different than zero we have a problem so we say t error um, database not pro initialized uh, student count should be zero okay and then if the database added our student we should have um, one so we would say database not properly uh, they uh, no, no, no. We would say adding new student failed. For whatever reasons, we don't know. All right. Um, so let's write a second test. So test um, students get. So let's do the same as before. We do this two things. And now we will also, um, yeah, we have to initialize it, check if it's zero. Um, we have to add a student and then we have to check if it's, so we're kind of repeating a little bit the same code. 
up to a point where we um, testing if we can get you know get by ID 0 no what was it ID 1 it, it is actually easier if we say student dot student ID right we should be able to get a new student new student from DB get uh, it's um, okay so if not okay that means there was a problem um, so we throw an error uh, couldn't couldn't find Tom okay and then if we got Tom we have to make sure that if new student name is different to student name oops student name or new student age is different to student age we know that the student ID must be the same but just to make sure new student student ID is different to student student ID then we have a problem right so we say the error and we say students do not match All right so we have now two simple tests uh, for adding and retrieving a student uh, we have to um, tidy up a little bit because we're basically testing this twice uh, we don't really need this test because this test kind of repeats the same um, initial setup we could isolate it and we could manually do the instead of using the count and add methods we could have our own secondary methods which operate on database directly it's a little bit of extra work but that's probably a tidier way of doing the testing i will leave it for now um, so yeah. let's try to uh, let's try to build it um, so let's see if we build as it is undefined it's uh, api student line 44 api student line 44 yes because we changed to student id uh, what else it's all good so if i run tests okay api student test is also to become repaired so we need to fix the student and student what else student and student okay what else uh, students test also has student test also is using this so let's see student id student id student id excellent so let's retry it yeah uh, we have yeah we probably don't want to run all the tests for now uh, let's let's kill it uh, I will just run go test uh, database test whoops database test um, yeah right because the database test doesn't have the 
Uh, you cannot run just single file because it requires the additional um, yes so the student tests and the API tests they were doing quite a number of things um, Well, yeah, let's let's try it. So let's go test the I'm not sure why it prints so much. Oh yeah, I have some I've been doing some extra things. Um Get status. Yeah, now I cannot tell. All right, so let me investigate what I am doing in the tests that it's so much printing out. Uh, let's first do this. So I'm um, testing adding students. There is nothing unusual here. Yeah, that looks good. We have our database tests. And in the API tests, I'm creating a new server for here. Yep, I'm adding this. Students, okay. Making the get requests. Get student Tom. Nothing unusual here. And we have the post tests. Nothing unusual here neither. Okay. So this looks pretty good. Maybe uh, maybe if I run go test, it actually tests more than the current project. I I have to tell it to test the local one. No, maybe. Okay. Anyway, I do have some problems. So I have a problem with um, initializing the database. Test student in it and database test 16 and database test 23 is failing let's check it out so database 16 we cannot connect to our local host okay let me check it again so if I dial into mongodb slash slash um, the default port Yep, let's see what the error was. So, one, two. Let's dial again. Yep. Right, um... This is a little bit untidy because I need to defer session close. I need to make sure that I'm not leaking anything. Um, so in here it's the same issue. I after I 
remove my database, I drop my database, I will Yeah, by the way, why it's this? Yeah, why it, it says if error is not nil, I am calling error. Did we code it like this? Seems like. If error is not nil, we return it. Yeah, the rest looks good. Uh, and we need to defer session close. Yeah. Okay, so let's try it again. You see the connections are now happening. So the tests open and close connections to the uh, Mongo server on the on the local host. Um, Test students MongoDB at panic, no reachable servers, recovered, no reachable servers. We still getting the, uh, the problem with, um, with the init database go test line 41. Okay, so line 41, we are initializing it and the database 22 is the panic if there was an error collect connecting. Of course, there is an error because we are not connecting to database name, we're connecting to database URL. Um, yes, that's... The name of the database is the text name of the database to where we store all our collections and the URL is the, the this thing uh, which we're using to connect to Mongo. So this is the URL to connect to the server. If you're using uh, Mongo Labs or something, you will be using this with the credentials. Um, and then the database name is this where we do db uh, so every time we dialing we have to use the url that was the problem right so again testing again still doesn't work it still throws 41 and 22 no 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 that's not the that was the old tests the tests run okay all tests now run okay um we got takes four seconds so to be a little bit verbose we can we can do this so it actually told um Uh, yeah, we would have to get all students. Yeah, those are the tests which we are doing. I'm not sure why we are querying Google here. Somewhere I missed um, the code which... Yeah, that's from handlers. And then the database students, yeah, the, the ad is here. So those are the two tests which we are running on the MongoDB and they are working fine. So all our uh, tests pass and the code is working fine. So um, we basically covered a very simple uh, API to the same as we had in memory. Uh, to, the, to the MongoDB, uh, dialing, connecting to the database, then 
uh, open like opening a session to the database driver then getting a handle to the database getting a handle to the collections and doing some stuff with it um, there is more to to it in terms of querying more complex queries and and searches and filtering and sorting but the basic things are kind of covered so i will make um i will stop the um the session here the only thing which we need to cover is the uh extra extra things for our collection right so we need to have um we need to um, declare um, what we want to constrain our collection, how we want to constrain our collection. And to do that, we will use the index. So I will check um, how the index looks like. So index is a struct which has yeah, a number of things. Uh, the first one, two, three, four, five things are kind of um, the, the things that we want to, to set up, right? So here we have a uh, key is uh, um, all the fields that we are constraining. So in our case, what we want the key to be is an array of strings. Whoops and it will be a student ID that we want to constrain. Then uh, the second thing was, so yeah, I can actually say key to make it uh, right. So if I was to Yeah, I will resolve it later. Let's just move on for now. I need unique drop dupes. I want the key to be unique, so I will say true. Uh, drop dupes, I will say true. Um, then there was background, build index and background. Yep, background is fine. We don't need to wait for it. Uh, and the final one was sparse. So sparse um, only index documents containing the key. Well, of course, because we will not have documents not containing the key. So we will say true here as well. Um, that means we have the index sorted. I just need to make sure um, that I'm initializing the array of IDs that we need to use correctly. I forgot what's the inline notation for initializing the array. It says it should be the bracket, but I don't think so. Um, yep, let's just check it quickly. So go line uh, array uh, slice of string. Um, Initialization. So let's see. Yes, so the, I forgot the type. Uh, so it was good the previous time. But if you say that we you have to dig. Yeah, still doesn't like it. No, oh, yeah, okay. It likes it now, but we don't use it. Okay, so we will call it an index, and we will then um, we will go back to this and check. How you um, 
continuous. So there is a, a call, and Schur's index is an index with the given key exists crazy. You can read a little bit more about this. And this one, uh, you basically call on the collection to ensure that the index is uh, of the given form that we are constraining it. Right, so in our case, what we will want is we will want session db, uh, db database name c db collection name and we want to ensure index and we will say index and then if there was an error we will panic basically as well because you know something is fundamentally wrong when we're doing the init so now what we've done with those few lines is we've made sure that if we try to add a student with the same student ID that the one that exists, it will not work. Before it would work because as with Anna, we've, we've been able to add multiple students with the same student ID because it was not a primary key. The primary key was underscore ID. But now with this constraint, um, I said this has this property, this key has to be unique, which means I cannot have duplicates. All right, so we can test it. Uh, so let's let's test it. Um, database based test. So let's say I will um, remove this part for now, and we will write a test which says. Um, so copy the adding test. So um, duplicates. Okay. So I have initialized the database. I have zero students. I'm adding. Uh, I'm adding Tom. I have one student, and then I'm getting Tom. I will not be getting Tom. I will add Tom again. And I will check if I have um, if I if I, if my count is one. So I'll, after adding Tom again, I want not this not this not to work. I want Tom like you know ID one to be added once. Um, so if it's not one, we should fail the test. Um, let's try it. All right. Duplicates test failed because we have now two toms, right? It's not one, it's two. So I will uncomment the constraint. So I will add this cons whoops. I will add this constraint in and we will run the tests again. I will run them without the verbals. So this time around we're running the tests and voila, we are guaranteed that adding the student second time round didn't work out, which is good. As you see through the tests, it's a little bit annoying that I'm adding the student uh, to do no error handling, right? So in my code, I'm calling add student and it actually doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't add that student because I had one student before and I have one student after this call and I'm not returning an error and I'm not returning a bool, bool or anything because our original um, student's API is a little bit dumb and it just takes a student and assumes it will always work, right? So now we see that testing is also quite useful to identifying some of the API sort of uh, problems that Maybe we should be returning an OK statement like we're doing with the get, or maybe we should be returning an error, which is empty if it 
works. So we can refactor it later and, and make it better. But this covers the basics for initializing, closing, uh, and using a database system with a single collection, with a single index, uh, without the duplicates. Um, so thanks. I will put the code into the repo now and close the session. So we have a number of things to add. So I will do this. I will check what did we modify. We modify all those five files. So I will add them all. And then I will check what new files do we have. We have database and database test. This is a binary file which is a compiled version and that was used for profiling. So uh, those should not be in the, um, they should not be in uh, edit to the repository. In fact, I will copy that. I will quit, whoops. And I will add them to Uh, let's add them here. So I will add them to the git ignore file. So now if I say git status, yep, git add, yeah, I will um, add that later. So I will say git commit adding persistence layer with MongoDB and git add git ignore git commit ignoring binary and test coverage files git push Excellent. So that concludes our session. Uh, we have the files now available for you on the students um, on the GitHub uh, students DB project. Um, the database and database tests are available, and you can use it as a template for building your own uh, persistence layer. When you're accessing something outside, you just modify the database URL. So if you're accessing your deployment server, you can keep it if the database is on the same host. If you're using Mongo Labs and the deployment of the database and the deployment of your logic are on two different hosts, you just specify where the, um, where the database is hosted. And for the code, it, it, it is the same. You're connecting using the MGO driver and using it the same way. All right, thank you very much. So we'll see you in the next lecture. Bye.